Mini episode 715 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by the Unheard Scene, your home for great music interviews of all stripes. Follow them on the web at unheardscene.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome, everyone, to mini episode number 715 of the FDH Lounge. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris. We are very privileged to have back on the show for our third conversation a legend of rock music, Steve Smith, one of the greatest drummers of all time. We first had him on the show, episode number 31. This is when we were doing full length episodes back on June 28, 2008. Subsequently, mini episode number 466. September of 2014. Very happy to be able to get him back on today. As I said, one of the very greatest of all time, and uh, that is by any number of different standards out there. Modern Drummer magazine uh, readers, they had voted him the number one all-around drummer five years in a row. Modern Drummer named him one of the top 25 drummers of all time, and he was voted into their Hall of Fame in 2002. Because again, there are very few people that have done what he has done at high levels in both the rock and the jazz worlds. And something that we have mentioned the two times on the show previously, and this was sort of just a background note, what he's been best known for through the, the course of his career is being the drummer during the most epic, legendary stage of Journey. And of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg with the man's career, but uh, as big as Journey is in pop culture, uh, to have been the guy riding the skins for that, that's going to be number, obviously the thing that uh, first comes to mind, as well as everything else that he's done. This time, that's not so much a background part of our conversation. That's part of the present, because he is getting back together with them for some tour dates. It has worked out scheduling-wise. We're going to talk a little bit about that, about how fortunately it's been able to hit, fit into his schedule and their schedule to be able to reunite on this basis. Additionally, his book, Pathways of Motion, Hand Technique for the Drum Set Using Four Versions of Matched Grip is out. We're very happy to have a copy of that with the DVD that comes with it, by the way. If you are studying drums, if you want to learn more about the world of drums, then who better to learn from than one of the maestros out there? This is basically your Ph.D. course in the drums, if you will, if you have this book. So it's a true pleasure to be able to bring him back on the program. As I say, one of the great music legends that we've ever featured on the show the one and only Steve Smith. Steve, welcome back to the show today, sir. Thank you for fitting us into your schedule. How are you today? Okay, Rick, I'm good. Thanks so much for having me on again. Pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, I have to say, your uh, last book that we were talking about when you were on, that great book, Roots of Rock Drumming, which, of course, had its own uh, additional uh, segment that, uh, that came with it, uh, the, the additional interviews that people could listen to. I have to say, I gave that to my nephew, Fletcher, who is uh, learning the drums and who is uh, getting to be, I think, very good at that. I will tell you what, I've done some cool things with the course of this show, and that is not a kid that's easy to impress, I'll tell you that. And his face just lit up when he got the book and when he delved into it, whatever. So for a kid that's not easy to impress, the chance to learn from you and what you had done with that book, talking to the great legends, I'm sure he would enjoy this one every bit as much. But uh, I can tell you firsthand how much people who are into the drums love your stuff. Well, that's great. Good to hear that. I mean, that book that you're talking about uh, is um, that's uh, called Roots of Rock Drumming, and and I went around yes. the USA and then over to uh, England interviewing drummers that were really the archetypes of rock drumming going back to the early mid uh, and late fifties and even early sixties, and so that was a really interesting project to find out how they approached the work, what they were thinking of, what kind of drummers they were to begin with, and, and then they got to tell their story in this book. So that that's a pretty interesting uh, collection of interviews. And then, like you said, there's a DVD with that, and you get to see these guys and, and hear them tell their story as well. So I, I find that to be a really interesting part of that project. Absolutely, yes. I mean, from a, from a music historical perspective, 
it's really wonderful from the perspective of somebody learning the drums like my nephew, a really great way to kind of learn from these guys, I would say in more of a big picture sense, what you're doing here with this book, Pathways of Motion, Hand Technique for the Drum Set Using Four Versions of Matched Grip, it's a very granular kind of a thing here as far as really kind of getting in the weeds, and if you're learning the drums, really kind of uh, getting into the specifics of how to approach it. So I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Having done a book from more of a general perspective on theories of drumming, now you've got one here that's, that's into the very, very specifics on how to get better. Yeah, the, the newest, like the, that's right, the one, Pathways of Motion, the newest book on Hudson Music just came out a couple of weeks ago. This is, it's, the focus is developing hand techniques so you have a, a fluid, relaxed, way of playing the drum set. And I focused on match grip because it's something that I've been working on seriously for about four years. Um, you know, I, as you know, I grew up playing jazz from a young age, so I grew up with what they called a the traditional grip. It's like the old, the old jazz and drum corps type marching band grip. And, uh, and recently, in addition to that, I've been working on the match grip myself and in that process made a lot of discoveries. So so basically I'm putting those out there uh, for other people to work with because uh, one of the things that I find and especially well, especially young players, they're very enthusiastic to want to learn how to play the drum set. So they get a drum set and they start playing right away with the bass drum, hi-hat, snare drum and you know toms and the whole kit. And so they, are, get, they get acclimated to playing beats, but they don't usually put in the time to develop finesseful hand technique because that takes focus work on a snare drum and or a practice pad where you just work on that hand technique. But the result of that is then it's much easier to play the drum set and, and your longevity will be improved because hopefully you'll, iron out and smooth out like potential bad habits and then develop good technical habits so your playing has a better sound, better feel, and uh, and you avoid injury with that. So that was more typical for my generation. I grew up in the 60s and a lot of focus was still put on uh, learning good hand technique and then playing the drum set. And so I felt there was a need for this um, for for some of those folks. And the other side of it is there's a lot of drummers that come up in drum corps and they have good hand technique for drum corps, but it's not necessarily adaptable to the drum set, which requires a more fluid, relaxed style. So so there's a lot of people that I feel could get get some help from this approach. And I use these ideas myself and have been sort of, let's say, educating and teaching myself over the last few years. And with Hudson Music, we just they asked me if I document this for the book DVD, which I was glad to do, and here it is. It's a very valuable resource, absolutely, for anybody that's learning the drums, trying to get better at it, no matter how long they've been playing. Uh, I myself do not have any background or expertise in that. Uh, back in the day when I was playing an instrument, it was the T-bone, so this is kind of like apples and oranges to me, but I was still perusing it and, and finding a lot of great stuff in here. There's one thing in particular I wanted to ask you about on page 71 here, because this is something you hear about sometimes with, with different instruments, maybe not so much motion, but... Uh, it, with other instruments, but you're talking about motion between the notes and what happens to right. set up between one note and the next and, and, and basically the movements through the air. Talk about that a little bit, please, because I think that's a thing that people would find interesting no matter what instrument they've played. Well, with the drums, we only hear one side of the motion. We hear the impact of the tip of the stick onto a drum head or onto a cymbal. But in between that, you're... you're, you're the stick comes back, your hand, wrist, elbow, arm, you know, your whole arm moves away so it can come back down again. And so much of what the book is about is what happens in between those impacts. And if I can draw an analogy to a couple other percussion instruments, like if you can imagine a shaker or a tambourine, in order for those instruments to work, the full 
stroke of the note is really important, the motion between those notes, because you hear two sides of it. You hear the downstroke of the shaker and the backstroke or the you know, left to the right of the tambourine. So the entire motion is crucial to be in time and have a nice rhythmic feel. With the drumstick, it really is the same, though most of the time people don't think about it that way because you only really hear one side of it. So once I had that realization, I, I really spent a lot of time with those pathways of motion, making sure that the entire motion that I'm making with my with the stick and, there, and therefore then analyze to the fingers, wrist, forearm, elbow, you know, to the shoulder, that all of those motions are very fluid and smooth and, and everything is in time. In terms of those motions, specifically, uh, what I'd like to ask you about is in, in terms of visualizing them, I did get a couple of pretty cool texts uh, with pictures here from our guest booker, Steve Servillo, who had seen you with these colored lighted drumsticks. And I wanted to ask you about that. They're very cool pictures. Am I, am I correct that this is uh, connected to some of the art that you have been creating uh, through drumming? No, that, it's all connected to the art. And that wasn't really instructional. I, was, I had a, a showing. Well, it's, it's going on right now in New York City, an art show with my drum art. So for people interested in seeing that, you go to stevesmithdrumart.com. And I, I created a series of, let's say, I don't know exactly what to call them. They're pieces of art on canvas using mm -hmm. lighted drumsticks in a, in a dark room with time-lapse photography. So I was able to create some very interesting image, images when you shoot pictures of the, the drumsticks going through space, moving through space, and and then when you photograph that with a like say approximately a 15 second exposure, it creates some very interesting imagery. And then we put that on canvas, and it creates some pretty cool art. So there's a showing at an art gallery in New York City called Art on A Gallery, and it, it opened uh, four weeks ago. And and two days and Thursday night will be a closing. And I'll be there Thursday night from 8 to 10 at Art on A Gallery uh, in, in the East Village. And I'll be there to demonstrate again what, how I created that art. So I bring a little, lit, a little kit in there and the lighted sticks and they turn off the lights and I do a demonstration of what we did to create the art. That's incredible. Now, my logical follow-up to that would be, when you're creating that kind of art, are you taking just any kind of musical pattern that, that you would normally otherwise use, or are you sort of crafting something specifically for this so that your motions look even cooler on canvas? You're completely right. Because, because oh. I've, when, they, when they asked me, to, there's a company called Scene 4 that came up with the idea, and they asked me, would you be interested in doing this? And, and I said, absolutely, because Vic Firth made these lighted sticks and they came out, you know, six years ago or something like that. And ever since I got those, I enjoyed practicing with them. And, and I'll practice with them at the end of the day and turn the lights out and sit in front of a mirror and practice and watch the shapes. And again, it's like part of this pathways of motion concept If this my shapes that I'm making in between the notes is nice and smooth. Usually it sounds nice and smooth. So anyway, I was so used to making those motions and I had a good idea of how to do the art with the lighted sticks where some drummers that have done this or other drummers like Carl Palmer and Bill Ward and Dave Weckl have done some of this drum art before and maybe they haven't used the light sticks. I went in there with a lot of ideas of what I wanted. And just like you said, I specifically did special motions like played press rolls on the snare drum and like put let's put the camera directly above the snare drum so you can see what those side to side motions look like and various things like that so i was able to create some very interesting art oh absolutely yeah that's that's incredible you know to kind of take that kind of expertise and be able to translate it to how you think it's going to look visually uh that that is really really incredible and i have to ask you too for, for somebody who's had the longevity that you have in the business uh i have to, to ask a question now uh, one of my all-time favorite drummers from my all-time favorite group uh neil perth from rush having the uh this, this uh, chronic uh, tendonitis here that is going to force him to retire as a regular uh, playing drummer of course which is uh, kind of kind of a sad thing not going to be able to tour that much if at all anymore so 
I'd like to ask you about that because I've never come across anything with you having any kind of health issues, uh, injuries, so I don't know if I'm missing anything or if you've been fortunate in that regard or if there's a certain kind of training that goes into it to kind of help avoid this kind of stuff. It was something I'd never really thought about before, but there's so much repetitive motion that you've been doing over a period of time. Of course, I can see where that could take a toll. So what has been the story for you with that? Well, first of all, it is really sad about Neil, and I I actually got really sad when I read his interview where he talked about uh, retiring and the issues that he's had. And I and I can understand it more in his case, and you know, and it's a little different in my case because he has been playing in Rush for his whole career, and they're mm-hmm. a pretty powerful rock man and he has a style where he plays very hard so I could see why why and how that could happen with him in my situation I definitely have had some injuries um, but for the most part I've been able to rehabilitate myself from those and adjust my technique because then during the, you know when I um, found myself having certain injuries, I could figure out what I was doing wrong that was causing those. And and some of it is wear and tear. But, for instance, like with my traditional grip, where you hold the stick, you know, with, with the left thumb, essentially, to the hand, I was having some problems there with one of my joints. The um, Just the cartilage was wearing out. So that's what led me to play more match grip you know, back to the pathways of motion. So I mm-hmm. found that that rehabilitated that problem for me because with the match grip, it's, a, it's like a little, it's less wear and tear on your hand. So, so I, when I play a gig, it's something like 75 to 80% match grip. And I still, you know, then I can play match grip, I mean, traditional grip for 25% of the show and there's no pain. So, so that was what my solution to that issue um, I've had some rotator cuff tears, not a hundred percent tear, but pretty serious tear. But with yoga and physical therapy, I've worked my way through that. Plus, adjusting my technique, lowering my symbols, and and just staying really mindful of my touch and sound. And so, I don't have any kind of major technical, physical type problems. But I think a lot of it in my case is because I've spent so much time refining my technique and staying within the boundaries of um, not pushing myself to play louder than necessary. Like I've found that there's a, an impact level where I hit the drums where, where I have a dynamic range from soft, medium to loud, and I stay within that dynamic range no matter what group I'm playing with. And, and you know, people are asking me now, well, now that you're with Journey, you're going to be playing, like, really loud and with fat sticks and different heads and all this stuff. And the answer is no. I'm, I'm, I play exactly the same way that I play with my own band. Really the only difference is there are more louder tunes than soft tunes, you know. So, so that will require, you know, some control and conditioning that because you know, because there will be more uh, bigger sounding louder tunes but it doesn't make me play louder than I play already whether I'm touring with my own band or somebody else's band so and that keeps me from having those injuries because I I keep control of the sound and playing with a good balance and you know with with not over smashing cymbals and hitting and breaking sticks and you know I haven't broken a stick in probably 15 to 20 years so uh, wow. keeping that control improves my sound so the sound man's really happy and the on stage volume is not that loud so there's no need for you know plexiglass aquarium around the drum set or anything like that and so it you know so I can just have a nice stage volume where where it's it's musical and that's really you know been my focus is this musical drumming that feels really good and then has a great overall sound and then allow the microphones to amplify that through the PA system. It's interesting because we've talked about these types of issues in, in variety before, but not in a physical health sense. So this is kind of an interesting extra dimension to it. And you're absolutely right about the contrast with Neil Peart because I think about the multiple times I've 
seen him do the drum solo in YYZ, and that alone, you multiply it by a couple of thousand, and yeah, you can see where the wear and tear comes from, but I wonder in your case, because again, we've talked about this every time you've been on, as far as the, the vast kind of diversity uh, that you've had in your career from being with Journey to, as you said, a lot of proud and jazz drumming to uh, picking up uh, Indian-style drumming and, and, and working with the different musical cultures around the world. The fact that you're mixing it up way more than he is, is, is that something, am I reading you right, that that's something that kind of protects you too because you're probably using different types of motions and not doing the same thing physically all the time? Something like that. But the main thing is that for the most part, most of the music I've been playing for the last 30 years takes place mm-hmm. in a dynamic range from extremely soft to moderately loud with occasional yes. loud. So I haven't had to play hard, you know, really hard. I just play for a good sound. But a lot of the times I'm playing in clubs, you know, I'm playing mm-hmm. in small theaters and 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 I'm playing with acoustic musicians. So it requires yes. me to have a lot of control about the overall volume. If I'm playing with an acoustic bass or an acoustic piano player or even a saxophone player, trumpet player, I can't be bashing the drums because it'll obliterate their sound and piss them off and not sound like music. But if you're in a band where everyone's electrified and you're the only acoustic instrument, the drums are the only acoustic instrument, you know, you, those, the bass player and the guitar player and even, his, let's say, electric keyboard player can turn the volume up to the point where they can drown out the drummer so the drummer may feel compelled <laughs> to play loud. And when you're in a situation of playing stadiums all the time, you could get in the habit of playing loud all the time, though it's not always necessary. But anyway, you could get into that habit. So any, my, my situation, I've been in mostly living in a world where my dynamic range from pianist to monumental forty to forte, very little double forte. So with Journey, we have a pretty large dynamic range, and and I am, in fact, reacclimating the band to playing with more of a dynamic range, uh, the way we used to, but maybe even more exaggerated than the way we used to, and now save the big, you know, the big sounds and the tunes that need it, and then. And play in a range where it sounds good, feels good, and it's musical. Well, very good anticipation there because I was just about to ask about that next. Uh, from the research that I had done before our conversation here, it seemed to touch upon more or less just a matter of scheduling, that uh, it finally seemed to work out for you with all your other uh, projects that you had the time to do this and that it worked out with them scheduling-wise. Is, is that the predominant thing with getting back together for this journey tour and joining them at this point? It's part of it. It's part of it. Um, mm-hmm. In the past, when they, they've asked me to, to play, there's, you know, it's never much warning. It's like, oh, we'd like you to come out, you know, today or, <laughs> or in a week <laughs> or something like that. And my schedule is generally booked at least a year in advance. And, uh, and, and also, I've been so satisfied musically with my own career and my own projects and playing uh, as a sideman with a lot of great jazz musicians, I haven't been inclined to want to play being in one band, Journey or otherwise, you know, just being in one band playing a set repertoire, you know, year in and year out. That that hasn't been anything that's interested interests me. But in this case, uh, they asked me last June if, if I would come out and play and I said, no, but how about next June? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> let's plan a year in advance. And so they said, okay, let's talk about that. So, in fact, that's what happened. And so we were able to plan in advance. And and I played out all the gigs that I had uh, last year and then um, scheduled in the journey tour, which they had an idea of they were going to tour from April to the beginning of September. And then I just blocked that in my schedule and I booked around that. And, and that's something that feels good to me. I can do that because I have, you know, I have great gigs before that tour and some really great gigs after that tour with the the rest of the year. And that feels like I need a complete musical diet to, to really feel satisfied. A lot of different projects and, I'll be doing everything from playing with Steps Ahead to 
a John Coltrane tribute at Birdland this September uh, to um, playing gigs with a big band. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to Europe to play with the WDR big band, a week-long schedule of playing with them and making a DVD and a recording. So I was able to schedule all these events in, um, which made it workable. So they asked me if I would commit to a two-year touring cycle, which I said yes. So that means you know, we're going to do this five-month tour uh, journey. We'll do a five-month tour from essentially from April through early September. And then next year we'll do some international touring and probably some more U.S. touring at, at that point. Well, what you say about uh, having a variety of musical styles and needing that to feel satisfied, I mean, that's something, and again, as a creative person I can relate to, I like to participate in a lot of different types of creative projects. I'm sure there's a lot of people that can relate to that as well. At the same time, given that you're getting back together with this group, you were the drummer during what we all associate as the glory days of Journey, and, and it's just so epic in American pop culture I'm just wondering if you can describe what it makes you feel inside getting back together with these guys and getting a chance to relive some of those days and, and play that music that really captivated uh, the world. That, that has to just be an indescribable feeling for you. It's been really interesting. We've, we've already rehearsed for four days, which will be the totality of our rehearsal for, for the tour. But it seemed like that's all, you know, the band doesn't need to rehearse the tunes. They already know the music. And, and I haven't played the music uh, for 32 years, really, even though we did a trial by fire, you know, that record in 96. I haven't played any of the classic tunes since about 1984. So I I actually didn't even really remember much of what I played on those records. And so I put myself through pretty serious training as far as uh, writing down and relearning all those tunes which was interesting to, to see, okay, this is what I came up with 30 years ago, and it's, I liked it. It seemed like I made some good decisions back then in my 20s, and so I relearned what I played, <laughs> but, but played it in a new way. I, you know, Even though I'm playing the same parts, I, I play the way that I play now, which I have a lot better technique and control, and, and I think the feel is a lot better and the dynamics are better, so... I brought that into the rehearsal room, and that was that was fun. And 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 I think like one of the things that Ross said to me, Ross Valerie, the bass player, is that now like the parts that he plays that are from the record, they fit hand in glove with the parts that I play. So so you know I'm playing, and I'm in a way hitting reset, meaning I'm bringing I'm playing the parts that I played on the record, but I'm starting with that as like my set point. Let's go right back to not even what we did live, but let's just take it right back to the records and, and hit reset. And let's, because these songs sound great on the record. There's no reason to overachieve, no reason to do anything other than play essentially what we played on the record. And then let's go from there. Let's see what develops from there but not to pick it up like where they left off after the last, you know, 20 years or so of touring, but to go back to the beginning. And, and that's feeling really good, and it's, it's pretty interesting for me, and, in the, and I think hopefully good for everybody else in the group as well. They're all, you know, we're all feeling like uh, it's, it's sounding musical and feeling really good. So we, we did play one gig already, and we, it was a corporate show in Las Vegas, which was a nice way to start, a little bit under the radar, and uh, and the group felt really great, and, and Arnell just really blew me away. He sounded amazing, uh, sang great, and, and we had a fun experience, And uh, but then the next show that we do is next Wednesday night, actually, um, and it's at Madison Square Garden, so talk about a trial by fire. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be on a double bill with Santana, and uh, and you know it, it feels like the pressure is on. But anyway, we'll you know we'll go from there. But uh, it'll be an interesting experience to say the least. Wow! So part of the city coming out uh, as far as uh, the new vital information NYC tunes uh, on there. Uh, of course, obviously the uh, the Journey tour going on, Pathways of Motion, hand techniques for the drum set using 
four versions of Match Grip, this uh, outstanding book. Uh, again, you're one of the very busiest guys that we have ever featured on the show. Always got a lot going there's, on. But there's one I more somehow more, feel. One more yeah, I'm going to say I don't want to miss anything. 14 <laughs> track of drum solo pieces. And that's called Fabric of Rhythm. And that goes with my art collection. So uh, the folks from Scene 4 are going to put together a coffee table book that will feature four, the, the, my pieces of art and I played a drum solo, one for each piece. <laughs> and that will be included on an LP vinyl record uh, in with this coffee table book. So that also is going to come out this summer. Absolutely. And, yeah, I, the, uh, I was selling it short, too, I guess, by uh, forgetting a second ago here, of course, the, the art show as well. So, yeah, so many different projects going on right now. Uh, I mean, it is this a particularly busy time for you? I mean, you seem busy always when, when we're catching up with you. You've always got a lot of balls in the air. I mean, this would seem like it's a significantly more busy period of time, but I don't know what the standard is. No, it's, it's a little more busy. I mean, definitely I've had very dense and busy years, but this year it's just because of the journey towards amplified things a bit more. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and also it gave me a deadline for some of these projects because I had it in mind to do the new Vital Information album and this solo record, but with the Journey Tour coming up, it gave me a deadline. I better, I better get this done now or I'm going to have to wait until the fall. So, you know, so I, I put myself in, in, in overdrive to get all these projects done. That kind of focuses the mind when you know you have to do something like that and uh, something as big as, uh, again, obviously a major tour with Journey, which, again, is, is going to be just amazing to be able to check out. And seeing you back with them is certainly going to be a treat for all of your fans. So, again, it's been a pleasure to talk about that with you and your new book, your art collection, your other projects that you have going on. As I say, again, uh, just such a, a wonderful all-around uh, type of musical career that you have going on. And I know that there's going to be so much coming yet in the future because, as you said, you're – always restless in these areas, always looking for new things to do and to try. And it's fascinating to uh, keep up with what you've got going on, Steve, but uh, we look forward to chronicling it in the future. Thank you so much Great. for taking time right, to be yeah, with us today you. for the thank third you. time. Sure, thank I you. really appreciate it. Thank you very much for the support. You take care. Well, we're, we're big fans of yours here, as you know, Steve. So, uh, again, just a uh, pleasure to be able to get to check out anything that you've got going on and talk to you and get your perspective about it. So, I really appreciate it. I can't thank you enough for your time, Steve. And thank you, everybody, today for tuning in to FDH Lounge, the episode number 715. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all Clear Channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 